Today marks Resurrection Sunday. And this, think of all days of Christianity, I believe this is the most celebrated day. And I got thinking about this, and I said, you know, maybe Christmas is probably the most celebrated day. And then I got thinking, actually, no. Who comes out on Easter to celebrate Easter? Those who believe in Jesus Christ. This is the day in which we worship our Savior, for, for he has conquered the grave. He has made payment for the sins of all mankind. He has conquered the grave. And listen, he rules and reigns at the right hand of the Father. What an opportunity we have to worship him today, don't we? One of the things that we are going to do this morning as we worship our Lord and Saviors, there's no better day in our calendar to worship the Lord than to remember Christ and all that he has done for us on the cross of Calvary through, through the Lord's Supper. And so I'm um, getting the note. We're going to let the kids go, I think. Yes, kids, you can swing out at this time. There we go. I totally forgot about you. Sorry. <laughs> No, nah, we can never forget our kiddos. We're so blessed to have them. So we're going to go ahead. We're going to have our men come forward. We're going to pick up the trays. We're going to pick the plates. And as they pass out this Lord's Supper, I want you to make sure you take both cups, not just one, but both, because one has a cracker, one has the juice. You don't want to be without one or the other. We're going to remember what Christ has done. All of this, this moment throughout history has been celebrated all the way back in the time which the, the children of Israel came out of Egypt. As they came out of Egypt, you guys can go ahead and just participate those. As they came out of Egypt, God had them participate in something called the Passover meal. And the Passover meal was to be participated in every single year. You guys have heard me tell this story, but it's so important. And when Jesus per, uh, participated in that last supper, that last night, just before he would go to the cross, he instituted what we now know as the Lord's Supper. But we need to understand something about the Passover from the very beginning of Israelite history. As they're coming out of the land of Egypt, God was already telling us that he would one day send his son to make payment on the cross at Calvary. For the spotless lamb would have to be sacrificed to make payment for sins. For God's word tells us, for the wages of sin is death. The payment for sin is death. It required a blood sacrifice. And that is what was portrayed in the Passover meal time after time after time again. The children of Israel did not completely understand what all this would mean at the time. But today as we have the scriptures in their entirety, we can now look back and put all the pieces together and see exactly what God was doing. God was saying, one day I would send a spotless lamb, my own son, to make payment for your sins. Again, as those children of Israel were coming out of Egypt, and they were in, in, the, in, the, in the wilderness there. They, they, were, they were rebelling against God, and so God sent serpents. And the serpent would bite them, and they would die. And then he had Moses do something that nobody understood. He, he built a cross with a snake on it, and that cross was to remind them, or it's literally a picture that one day upon a cross, God would make sacrifice for the man, sins of mankind. They didn't understand that. Fast forward, the children of Israel, they've been scattered abroad. They've lost their promised land. They're scattered everywhere, and Rome is now in control. And for 500 years, God is silent, and nobody knows what's happening. Nobody understands. They're crying out, Yahweh, what happened to you? Where'd you go? But for 500 years, God is silent, and during that period of time, God's doing something. He's establishing a, a, a series of roads and, 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 and transport and, and, and commerce and, and building uh, an entire industry so that when the Messiah would come, all the people would be gathered closely together and Jesus would be able to walk roads and, and journey between villages easily to declare his message. The message was not one that they fully understand for he preached the kingdom of God. They didn't fully understand that. But he also told them, listen, one day, one day, I will make payment for the sins of mankind. One day, I will be killed. One day, I will be buried. And, and three days later, I will conquer the grave. And they didn't understand that. They didn't see that. They didn't recognize what he was trying to teach them. But once again, as Jesus participates in that Passover meal, that last supper, I can't help but wonder, as they're participating in this meal and the spotless lamb is presented, 
Jesus knows full well that just in a few days, he would fulfill being the sacrificial lamb for the sins of mankind. What a moment for Jesus. It's in that moment that Jesus chooses to do something that nobody expected he would be a servant. He began to wash the feet of his disciples, demonstrating one more lesson, that he was a servant king. He came to serve, not to rule and reign. Not in that moment. And he came to serve in a powerful way. He came to serve mankind with his very blood upon Calvary. In these two little cups, we have a cracker. The cracker represents just Jesus' brokenness. You see, the Romans, they were masters at manipulation and, and killing and, 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 and torture. And so he would be scourged, beaten with a whip, tormented. I had out yesterday a, a crown of thorns. And, and people all week have been coming by the office. They've been looking at this crown of thorns. They've been touching it, realizing, oh, this, this is sharp. They put a crown of thorns upon his brow and they beat it down into his skull. They broke him. They bruised him. They tore his flesh. That's what this little cracker represents. The body of Jesus Christ. In Mark chapter 14, we have the account of that last supper. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Father, thank you for this little cracker. May we never forget the sacrifice that your son gave for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks and gave it to them, and they all drank from it, and he said to them, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. Assuredly, I say to you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new, in the kingdom of God. This little cup represents the blood of Christ that was spilled for us upon Calvary to make payment for the sins of mankind. But Jesus is telling the disciples something very important, something that we must grab a hold of. For it is a future promise that one day at the marriage supper of the Lamb, Jesus will raise his cup and we will drink of the vine with him. Father, thank you for this little cup. Thank you for the remembrance it gives us of Christ's blood. In Jesus' name, amen. Many of you know that I teach religion on a university level. And something that all those religions have in common is this. Their leader is dead. Every one of them. You know what distinguishes us? Our Lord and Savior lives. The Savior lives. We serve a risen Savior, one who conquered death. As I was trying to figure out what is it I should be preaching on or speaking of today, I, I realized that, you know, there is no greater hope than the resurrection. And so I, I, I decided to come up with a few things. And, I, and the list was very long. I was trying to figure out what to give you. But you see, in our lives, the resurrection changes everything. Everything is changed. And so we wanted to give you a little bit of a taste of how the resurrection can change everything. And so here, here is uh, a couple thoughts for you this morning. First off, the evidence of the resurrection is overwhelming. Father, bless us now as we dig into this message. Father, may the evidence of the resurrection change our hearts and our lives and our perspective. And Father, maybe even equip us to speak truth and love into the world around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever met somebody who liked to argue? Now, don't look at your spouse. It's okay. I remember at one point in my ministry, I had a gentleman come in, and, and he wanted something for a group, and that group didn't come and ask. We would have said yes, but he wanted something from us, and so uh, he came to me and started, started saying, I want this to happen. I said, well, I don't think they want this to happen. No, I want this to happen. This is what they need to happen, and I began to realize in this conversation that no matter what I said, no matter where I went, no matter how I rationalized with him, he was not going to, to listen to what I was saying, and so finally, I looked at him. I said, hey, I said, um, 
I said, it seems to me as if this conversation is not going to end until you get your way. He says, absolutely right. <laughs> so my response to him was what he was not expecting. I said, well, I guess this conversation just ended, and I walked away. How dare the pastor walk away from me? Turns out the group didn't want that at all. I even brought it up to him and said, hey, so-and-so wanted this. He says, why would we want that? People love to argue. Do you know why people like to argue? Because they want to be right. And if they're wrong, they still want to be right. Have you ever met someone you knew was wrong and they knew they were wrong, but they still argue because they wanted to make it look like they were right. right? Right? Okay. All right. We got that. Here's what Jesus tells us. And whoever will not receive you nor hear your words, he's given the disciples instructions just as they're about to go out. When you depart from that house or city, shake the dust off your feet. Paul says this in Acts 18, verse 6. But when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am clean. For now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Listen, there's a difference between contending for the faith and being bold about the faith and wasting your time on somebody who will not be rationalized with. I think of the high school level. I think of the college level. I think of several different le levels. And, and teachers make claims about Christianity, make claims about the resurrection. Oh, it can never be possible. People don't come back from the dead. <laughs> We're going to see in a moment how possible that truly is. It's because people like to parrot. You guys know what a parrot is? Anybody got a parrot? Oh, good for you. Okay. Um, <laughs> people like to repeat what they've heard but know nothing of what they're actually saying. Teachers... Teachers do this, especially when they have a little fact or something they want to quote. I hear it all the time. It's people spouting stuff. They don't know what they're talking about, but they do it anyways. Why? Because they want something to grab a hold of. And both Jesus and the Apostle Paul tells us, listen, when you try to reason with them and they will not be reasoned with, shake the dust off and move on. But some people just need a convincing argument. Some people need you to be able to engage them on an intellectual basis and begin to reason with them. And they are actually seeking. They are actually want to know what is truth. And, and so don't give up on people either. When people seek God and his truth, God will reveal himself. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. The Proverbs says this, I love those who love me and those who seek me diligently will find me. Hebrews 11, chapter 6, but without faith it is possible to please him for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a reward of those who diligently seek him. You see, here's what God is saying. If you want to seek my face, I will reveal myself to you. If you are seeking for wisdom, if you're seeking for guidance, if you are looking for God, that is the heart that God desires and he will reveal himself. And so as we engage the world around us, look for the seeking hearts. Seek out those who are looking for something more than what they have and introduce them to the Lord Jesus Christ. The resurrection proves that everything else Jesus claimed, said, and taught was true. Now, the evidence of the resurrection is overwhelming. After the resurrection, Jesus made several appearances, beginning with that first appearance, Easter morning, Mark chapter 16, verse 1. Now, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought spices and they, that they might come and anoint him. Very early in the morning on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen, and they said among themselves, who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away. For it was very large, and entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting at the right side. And they were alarmed, but he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who is crucified? He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? But go tell his disciples and Peter and he, that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him as he said to you. 
So we see that in Mark chapter 16, verse 9 now, that he first appeared to Mary Magdalene. Now there are those, mostly people who think that they're teachers, who like to discredit or attempt to discredit discredit the resurrection. Can I ask you a question? If all writers of all four Gospels wanted to discredit the resurrection, why on earth would they start the testimony of the resurrection, would they start the evidence of the resurrection with women? Now, don't take me wrong. (laughs) Some of you are like, what? (laughs) Think about the context. Think about the day. They lived in a patriarchal society. The testimony of a woman was not considered by others as being reputable. Now, you and I would read this passage and be like, yeah, women found him first, you know? But in that society, in that culture, what's going on here? We have to verify what the women said. Now, if I had to verify what my wife said all the time, I'd be in big trouble. Like, don't you believe me? (laughs) Right? But in that culture... If you're trying to develop a, a, a rue or a lie and, and make something happen and the world thinks to be true, you're not going to start with the least likely testimonies, right? You're probably going to get some scribe or Pharisee to come out and say, hey, look, Jesus is gone. He rose from the grave. You're going to look for someone that someone's going to listen to. Maybe even the Roman soldier was like, hey, we were guarding there. The stone rolled away and Jesus came walking out. We couldn't stop him. Uh, there are all kinds of testaments they could have chose to write into the story, but they chose to write exactly what happened. Women, and I think it's because God loved Mary Magdalene. God loved Mary, uh, the mother of James. God loved his followers, and he recognized that those women with such a heart of compassion who had come to anoint his body, he wanted just to bless them and let them be first. First. Here's another account, Acts chapter 1, verse 3. To whom also he presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs. Now, the writing in the day, and the people that they're being written to, many of them would have been around. He says, infallible proofs, meaning these proofs are unquestionable. Unquestionable. Infallible proofs being seen by them during 40 days. How long was he on earth after the resurrection? 40 days. And speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So not just a one-time appearing, not just showing up like a, not that at all. 40 days walking around, talking, eating, whatever he's doing, right? 40 days. Here's what Paul writes, for I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And that he was seen by Cephas. Who's Cephas? Peter. So we know that Peter saw him. And then by the 12, okay. After that, he was seen by over 400 brethren at once. Now, if this was just a coincidence, like, you know, you, you, you drank some, um, some juice and it was a little overdone. Jesus, no. Over 500 people at one time saw Jesus. And Paul says, if you don't believe me, here's what he says. Of whom the greater part, the greater part of what? Most of the 500, the greater part remain to this present. Know what he's saying? If you don't believe me, go ask someone who saw him in person. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also as one born out of due time. It is estimated that there were over 900 eyewitnesses of the resurrected Jesus. 900 eyewitnesses. Now, for certain in Paul's passage, 500. For certain. But it's estimated over nine. Because, again, many times in the Bible, when they they counted numbers, they weren't including the women and children. So somewhere around nine is they're estimating. 900 eyewitnesses. This many eyewitnesses in the court of law today would prove a pretty strong case. Wouldn't you agree? Next eyewitness, listen, we've seen 200 already. We don't need to see the other. No, 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 you're going to see every one of them. (laughs) The evidence of the resurrection is overwhelming. 
Um, Sean McDowell, who is an author, speaker, professor, he's an apologist, he share, shares that there are over 20 arguments that build a powerful case for the resurrection. So if you don't like one, pick another one of the 19. For example, was there any benefit to Rome for Jesus to rise from the grave? Was there any benefit to Rome for them to pretend that Jesus rose from the grave? No. There are those who would argue that Romans stole the body of Jesus. Listen, that makes no sense at all because Rome didn't need a Jesus anymore. They wanted peace and quiet. And besides, if he's the king of Israel, the king of the Jews, we don't want another king hanging around. There's no benefit to the Romans to even make it look like Jesus rose in the grave. How about this one? Was there any benefit to the scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees and all those other sad people you see? Um, that, was there any benefit to them to have Jesus walk around? Was there any benefit to them for, for this story to be propagated that Jesus rose from the grave? No, they wanted to be done with Jesus. So they wouldn't have taken the body. If you were a disciple of a teacher who claimed to be the Messiah, and now he's dead, would you want to keep following him? No. No. Would you be willing to die for a false teacher? No. Reputable ancient historians, non-believers, and even Roman historians of the time all backed up the claims of the gospel writers. Non-believers saying, yeah, <laughs> yeah, something happened. Now, we could fill this morning with evidences of the, and arguments for the resurrection, but what is important for us to realize today is the evidence of the resurrection is overwhelming, and the resurrection of Christ changes everything changes everything. We celebrate, we worship a risen Savior. The second thing I want you to see is the resurrection is proof that Jesus is the Messiah. His resurrection validate, was a validation that Jesus was literally the Son of God. Matthew chapter 16, verse 1, then the Pharisees and Sadducees came and testing him and asked uh, that he would show them a sign from heaven. Remember last week we talked about how everyone's like, show me a sign, show me a sign. So the, the, these, these religious leaders are saying, hey, show us a sign. And he answered and said to them, now this is Jesus talking, here's what he says. When it is evening, you, will, you say it will be fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today for the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites. You know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign shall be given to it except the sign of the prophet of Jonah. And he left and departed from them. What is he talking about? The sign of the prophet of Jonah? Jonah? What? What? The sign of the prophet of Jonah, it, it was... It was something that Jesus, it was a metaphor that Jesus had used with the religious leaders already. So they understood what he was talking about. Like they remembered him teaching this. The people might have been standing there going, huh? But the people he's speaking to, those religious leaders, they got it. And for us to understand what was happening there and what he was saying there, we need to go back in time a little bit. So that was Matthew chapter 12. Or I'm sorry, that was Matthew chapter 16. Now we're going to go to Matthew chapter 12. So we can go backwards about four chapters that some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days in the night, and nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Did you see it? For Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. You don't get to see a sign, but you're going to see a sign. Three days, three nights, Jesus will rise from the grave.
You see, the resurrection proves that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. What did the Messiah come to do? He came to save. He came to save. Jesus said this. He says, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There are a lot of religious groups out there who will add works. They will say, you got to be good. you got to do this. you got to pray this prayer. you got to have communion. you got to, got to do this. you got to do this. got to do No. No. There's only one way to the Father. That is through the Lord Jesus Christ. We love this passage of Scripture around here in its entirety, not just the first verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Okay? But we keep going. But for God did not send his son into the world to condemn. Now, I want to stop there. Christianity is not a religion that condemns others. We're not supposed to be condemning others. The Bible says we're not supposed to be judging others. We're supposed to be looking at the fruit, things like that, and helping one another grow. Yes, but the Bible says that God did not come to condemn us. What does it tell us? He, um, he came into the world, or not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. You see, we are all sinners. We all sin. Now, when we share the gospel, we used to say, at least I used to say, hey, you're a sinner. And people say, uh uh. My understanding now as an adult is this. We all didn't have a choice. We were born in condemnation. How many sins must we commit to be a sinner? Zero. We were born that way. We had no choice. We can thank Adam for that. So God came to save those who were already condemned. That's every one of us. Have you put your faith and trust in Christ? Because let me tell you something. The resurrection changes everything. And when you put your faith in Christ, everything changes. Perception changes. The world changes. All that you understand comes through a different looking glass. And I will tell you this, life changes. Have you put your faith and trust in the Messiah? Thirdly, the resurrection speaks to the power of God. The resurrection speaks to the power of God. Here's what John chapter 2 verse 19 says. Jesus answered said to them, destroy this temple... And in three days, I will raise it up. Now, the people there thought he's talking about the temple there in Jerusalem. No, he says, destroy this temple, and three days later, I'm coming up out of the grave. Ain't nothing going to stop me. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 55, he says, O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God um, who, 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 who gives us the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. In the Lord. You see, not even death can hold us back from God's plan. Nothing we face in life can hold us back from God's plan. Death itself cannot hold us back from God's plan. To be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. And listen, the Bible also tells us that literally um, we, our days were written in the book of life. God knew when we would be born. God knows when we will die. So what do we have to fear in life? Not even death. Why? Because we will die on his timetable, not ours anyways. So what do we have to fear? Our nation went through a pandemic and everyone's running around scared for their lives. And we're sitting there going, Why? If I'm supposed to die from COVID, I will die from COVID. If I'm going to die from a car crash, I'm going to die from a car crash. If I'm going to die, die from choking on a fly, I will die from choking on a fly. God's timetable is God's timetable. It doesn't mean we run around licking doorknobs and trying to get hit by a car. It's God's timetable. You see, the resurrection speaks to God's power. And the fact of the matter is this. God is in control. Jesus, he heals the sick. He brings sight to the blind and the beauty of sound to the deaf. Jesus commands the dead back to life. And, and even after allowing fallen men to crucify him, Jesus conquers death itself. Amen. Romans chapter 8, verse 38. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, principalities, or powers, nor things present, nor things to come, 
nor height, nor depth, nor, nor any created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Can I ask you a question? What are you facing right now? What's going on in life? What is that heavy thing that burdens you down? What do you need? Jesus changes everything. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. The resurrected son came to forgive sin and to save the lost. 1 John 4, 14, and we have seen and testified that the father has sent the son as savior of the world. Titus 2, chapter, or 2 verse 11, for the, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. We've all seen him. Romans chapter 10, verse 13, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Who is a whoever? Everyone. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You have a Lord and a Savior who did not come to judge you. He came to save you. He came to forgive you. And if you have never experienced the forgiveness of God, you're missing out on the greater story he has for your life. The resurrection speaks to the power of God, the life transformation that he can bring. The resurrection offers hope beyond this life. Before raising Lazarus from the grave, Jesus said this. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. John chapter 5, verse 24. Jesus again is speaking. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who has sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. But do not, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you star as others have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. If you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, it offers hope because of this very reason. When you die, that's not the end. That's just the beginning. There's great hope in the resurrected Jesus Christ. The psalmist declares this. Your eyes saw my substance yet being unformed, and in your book they were all written. The days fashioned for me, when as yet there was none of them. Listen, one day we will come face to face with God. Have you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? Have you put your trust in Jesus and the resurrected Savior? So the resurrection offers hope beyond this life. The resurrection emboldens us to declare the gospel of Christ. Matthew chapter 26. In the hour, Jesus said to the multitudes, Have you come out as against a robber with the swords and clubs to take me? This is the Garden of Gethsemane. They're coming to take him. I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, and you did not seize me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled then, listen, listen closely, then all the disciples forsook him and fled. Where was this following? They fled. In fact, in Luke chapter 22, we see that even Peter, the most, the, the, the most aggressive vocal person, denied him three times. Where was his followers? What happened to them? You see, the disciples, they were terrified. They fled. But after the resurrection, everything changed. In fact, after the resurrection, after they saw the resurrected Jesus Christ, the disciples literally took on the world. They faced huge consequences for their ministry, but they were willing to stand up and declare the goodness of Jesus Christ. And to this day, 2,000 years later, we still declare the good news of Christ and his resurrection. Why? Because the disciples were bold, even in the face of death. You realize that all but one of them was put to death? And being assembled together, 
with them, he commanded them not to depart Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Later in that book we read, and when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Because of the resurrection, we too have received the Holy Spirit at salvation. And because of the resurrection of Christ, we too are called to boldly declare the gospel and message of Jesus Christ to the world around us. He left us with his commission. All authority has been given, given to me in heaven and earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, it changes everything. So go and declare the good news of Christ, because it is good news. It is good news. Father,